Amen. Amen. How's everyone doing this morning? Doing well? Good, good. My name is Pastor Sandy Roberts, and I'm the Pastor of Connections here at Vision Church. I'm going to be an honor to uh, preach the word this morning. Uh, a few things just before we uh, hop in. Uh, first and foremost, thank you for braving uh, the sleet and snow that you probably saw coming in. It's like, holy cow. That's the triangle weather for you. If you don't like it, wait five minutes. It will be different. As y'all can see, y'all, we have so much going on. Please go to our website. Um, I, it's, I, I'm overwhelmed even listening. I'm like, man, there's so much going on. Of course, we have Easter coming up, um, Women's Weekend. There's, I mean, please just go to the website and get filled in on all that we're doing. We know that Sunday's a start, but gosh, there's so much more going out, going on in this body outside of a Sunday that we want to invite you into. So just go to the website, please. We want to get you connected. And again, go ahead and start inviting people for our epic Easter weekend. Again, we have the Friday night, the carnival that will be on site. But then we got two services on Sunday. Two services on Sunday. How many? Two services on Sunday. And so we want, we want to invite folks. That's why we're doing it. Uh, we might even ask that you might be willing to get up a little bit earlier and come to that 9 a.m., heaven forbid. We have coffee in the back. Amen. Would you be willing to maybe commit to come to 9 a.m.? But we want you to invite people. And then lastly, um, I don't do this often. I'm not a big graphic T-shirt guy, but Josh and Nitra gave me a God is Dope uh, sweatshirt. And so I want to say thank you to them. That's in the back. And on that note, thank you all for serving. And I just want to thank, I mean, again, and we could do this every Sunday. But there are so many people who serve that we don't, you don't see, whether it's with the Vision Kids in the video, uh, the video booth in the back, the deacons. There are so many people who give on a Sunday. And so just I, I have just a small token from the elders of appreciation just to say thank you all for what you do for the Lord. We, we could not do that without you. All right. Well, let us hop in. Guys, we are going to be continuing. Pastor Sean took us through uh, kind of uh, the, the next part of 1 Corinthians. He passed the baton to me. So I will be in 1 Corinthians 11, starting at uh, verse 17 through 34. That's where I'll be preaching. But this morning, we are just going to be reading, and I, this is a little bit different than the notes here. We're just going to read uh, 23 through 29. We're going to condense just for the reading. And this is talking about the Lord's Supper, also known as communion. Excited to walk through a time-tested tradition of the Christian church that bonds and unif- that, that unites us. But goodness gracious, if we do not take it for granted at points. So if you would, here at Vision, we do stand for the reading of God's word. Would you stand with me? And we're going to start again, 1 Corinthians 11, starting at 23, and we'll read to 29. Starting at verse 23, would you join with me? For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night and when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself in this way, Let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. Whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. You may be seated, and would you join me in prayer? Jesus, we come here on a Sunday, and sometimes we just need to just take for a second just to kind of check in with ourselves. We sometimes rush to get here, and we know we have plans after this. Lord, I just ask that even in this moment, by the Holy Spirit, this might be a time of rejuvenation. That as I bring your word and want to convey this rightfully, Lord, convey the truth in the right context with conviction, clarity, and encouragement. That there might be a peace that surpasses all understanding that would guard the hearts and the minds of those listening today. That we would not go through, that this wouldn't just be another Sunday, Spirit, that, that even in the as we talk through a tradition and a ritual that we do regularly, 
And somehow we might think about it differently as we tell and retell the beautiful story of sacrifice and resurrection of you, Jesus, and how that same story has intersected our life in profound ways that has left us utterly different and transformed. Spirit, would you move? Would you move today? I'm excited for what you're going to do. We ask all these things in your name with thanksgiving. And everybody said, amen and amen. Well, let me say this much. I am a big traditions guy. I'm a big traditions guy. In particular, I have a certain game day ritual as it pertains to UNC athletics. Now, I know there's going to be some folks here who, yes, I know. And congratulations. I, I need to say it because this is way heavy on my heart since last night. Congratulations to our Duke Blue Devils for winning their ACC championship. It kills me to say. So whether it's a, a fall home football game or a UNC basketball game, which believe me, I have sweated through too many of those this year. I generally, the tradition that I have, I generally wear my favorite polo. I like to watch or attend with my dad, something that him and I do. I scream profusely, my wife can attest, and I care way too much about the outcome. Are you with me? <laughs> I thoroughly enjoy these traditions, though, and I greatly look forward to every one of these games, even the ones they lose. And despite having attended other universities, including a rival of UNC, I can't help that ever since I was a child, I was indoctrinated to be a UNC fan. I just have to say it. Even one of my earliest birthdays was at a UNC versus Virginia football game. You know, people will ask me, why do you even cheer for UNC? You didn't go there. And I always respond with, you cannot erase a childhood of loyalty and indoctrination. I never had a choice. You see, these traditions, they become rituals time and time again. And these tested rituals, they are a remembrance of the story of my fanhood. And as I partake of these, I am retelling the story of my fanhood that is shaped to me time and time again. Now, maybe you have some traditions in your own life that kind of tell the story about who you are. These may come through family trips over the summer. They may come through family reunions that you do at certain places with certain parts of your family. Maybe these are traditions that you have around holidays, Christmas, Easter, birthdays. I bet if I gave you the mic, everyone here would have a unique tradition that you in, engage. And really, if you were able to share, it tells a story uh, about how you, were, how you grew up and what has made you. And I, I tell you, there's an importance of tradition because they are an anchoring point to help you connect and reconnect with people and places that tell the story of who you are. And so there's a gift in these traditions. They are, in general, a yearly reminder of something to look forward to. You know that at certain points they're coming, certain dates you can prepare yourself for, and you look forward to those. But there's also a, a caution, right? These same traditions, we can become ritualistic, and we always know that with another one ahead, it can become, pro it can become programmatic, or we may just take it for granted. We lack gratitude because we know that there will be another one. Today, we are going to dig into one of the most time-tested traditions of the Christian church, the Lord's Supper. This, in its very basic essence, is meant to remember and retell the story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And it has, it has a, a profound significance in our Christian faith because it has been since the beginning of our faith, but it is also done not just here at Vision on a Sunday, but in other churches throughout the, throughout the West, but throughout the world, it connects us. But it is also a reminder about our own personal salvation and the story of how Jesus entered and shaped our own life. So now we are given some important details, instructions today, but we know there's some challenges, and we're going to break those down as well. Paul, in this 1 Corinthians, 17, 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 34, breaks it down into three parts. Verses 17 through 22, we hear about issues of the church coming together. Issues in church, what? Secondly, we will see in verses 23 through 26 an instruction of how to retell the story of what Jesus did on the cross. And then lastly, we see in verses 27 through 34 an examination of ourselves but also the community. 
So, so, what, so what is shaping the context of how Paul, because he just doesn't leap into this is how you do communion. No, he, he begins, he, he actually has some challenges for this church in Corinth, which is, they're struggling on some levels. They're trying to come together. This is the early church. They're trying to figure out what it means to keep Christ central. But when the flesh is involved, we know there's going to be issues. Amen? So what do we see? And I got five things we see leading up to chapter 11. First is this, rivalry and factions. In 1 Corinthians 1.11, it says this, For it has been reported to me about you, brothers and sisters, by members of Chloe's people, that there is a rivalry among you. Rivalry and factions. Number two, we see there is tension between worldly wisdom and wisdom from above. This is in 1 Corinthians 2, 6, and 7, which says, We do, however, speak a wisdom among the mature, but not a wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. On the contrary, we speak of God's hidden wisdom in a mystery, a wisdom God predestined before the ages of our glory. Third is this, we see spiritual immaturity. I know you remember this verse in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. For my part, brothers and sisters, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the, fe- of the flesh, babes in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, but since you were not ready for it. In fact, you are still not ready for it because you are still worldly. For since there is, again, envy and strife among you, are you not worldly and behaving like mere humans? Number four, sexual immaturity. Or, uh, yeah, sorry, sexual immorality. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 and 2. It says this, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and the kind of sexual immorality that is not even tolerated among the Gentiles. A man is sleeping with his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Shouldn't you be filled with grief and remove from your congregation the one who did this? Again, these are all sermons in and of themselves. And lastly, there's issues around Christian rights and liberties, which Pastor Jerome has preached on. Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial, 1 Corinthians 10 says. Everything is permissible, but not everything builds up. But no, no one is to seek his own good, but the good of the other person. So, it kind of sounds like this church is having unique problems, right? Absolutely not. These are some of the same problems that have plagued Christians and the churches they reside in for centuries. So this commandment, the Lord's Supper, to remember the Lord's death is being perverted by factions and divisions, selfishness and disorder. But we shouldn't be surprised because James 3.16 says this, For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there is, disor- there is disorder and every evil practice. And as we see, this church in Corinth is dealing with this, and it's impacting them with telling the story of Jesus, the gospel, the good news. So let's take a little bit of a look at kind of how Paul talks about this in, in our verses today as it relates to the sacrament of communion. 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen says this, Now in giving the instruction, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. Say worse. For to begin with, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and in part, I believe it. Indeed, it is necessary that there be factions among you so that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Paul is coming out swinging here. The issue of division is back front and center, as we've seen throughout much of this book, uh, this letter to the church in Corinth. Divisions are nothing new for the church. I hate to say it but it's the truth. Division and disunity have plagued humanity since our creation. Let's go back to Genesis 3. Remember how Satan devised a scheme in the garden whereby man and woman were not unified on how to address the serpent's question of, did God really say? The same division caused a division uh, or put harsher a fracturing in our relationship with man and self, between man and man, and ultimately us and God, going back to the beginning And we have been paying the consequences ever since. So let's let's bring this home. I know this is in a biblical sense, but how do we see this play out in the church? Maybe say the Western church, American church. Well, one, it doesn't take long to turn on the news or go to some Christian website and to know that the Southern Baptist Convention has certainly has its misgivings around abuse and race and leadership. 
We see that there are celebrity pastors that, have ha- that are having major moral failures. And I'm not going to list names, but there are some big churches that have been utterly broken down by pastors who have put their self abong, uh, before the Lord's glory. There's been immense political infighting. That's, that's nothing new. Right or left, right or wrong, Republican versus Democrat. This is also what we see in the church. And we see denominations splitting and dividing. The United Methodist Church is on that right now, this, uh, the, the denomination that I grew up in. So we know that division is happening, and these are just a few giving, these are a few examples. But let's, let's look not too broad, but how about right here at home? How does division at home at Vision Church creep into our body? These are some important questions I want us to ask, and I'm trying to ask myself. Do we see people as God's creation or a means to an end? Do we shirk community with God's family for ease and convenience? Do we actively misstep confrontation or directness? I'm preaching to myself here this morning. Don't get it twisted. Do we allow spiritual immaturity to fester and to continue to wreak havoc on ministries? These are a few things, again, just questions. But they do play out here, even at home. And so Paul is looking to challenge and press into this issue. How can we talk about communion with Christ when we, dis, when we devalue and disrupt communion, communion with the community of his church? You catch all those C's? That's a good Baptist alliteration right there. He is saying that inherently there are folks who are not followers of Christ that are within the body, and they must be shown for what they are. Now, again, this is, this is hard, harsh language, it do, but it's important because our churches are a light, and what comes out of them, people are looking to judge and say, yes, I knew that, I knew the church would be like that. Remember uh, earlier in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul says this, when you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and I am with you in spirit and with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, hand that one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Regarding, this is, and again, regarding assembling with the church, and it talks about those who are in but not of. Factions are people intent on living according to their own standard have to be highlighted so they can be corrected in grace and that the unity of the assembled must be fought for at a very high cost. Because, because earlier what I said, the world is looking for an excuse to point to the finger of the church and say, I knew this community was no different than this civic group, than this fraternity or sorority or this sports club. Y'all, we have to fight for unity We have the spirit inside of us that yearns for it, but we also have a flesh that we battle regularly. That even coming in here, you know, there's people you saw and you're like, man, if I said what was really on my mind, they might throw me out of this place. There are certain ministries you don't want to be a part of because you were hurt in them. There are certain things even that might have been said from the stage you don't agree with and you want to walk away. Y'all, we must fight for unity in this church. (laughs) Continuing on in verse 20. Paul says this, when you come together, then it is not to eat, then it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For at the meal, each one of each one eats his own supper. So one person is hungry while the other one gets drunk. Don't you have homes in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I praise you? I do not praise you in this manner. So first we wrestled with divisions, and now we must deal with distractions. Paul says, you come together to tell the story of Jesus. You, sorry, you come together to not tell the story of Jesus, but because of distractions and divisions, there is nothing praiseworthy about your gatherings. In this case, food and drink, which are both gifts from God, are meant to represent something much deeper, yet they have become idols in and of themselves. So we're reminded, Paul says again in Romans 1, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve something created instead of the creator who is praised forever. Amen. People are getting drunk at the same meals where they're supposed to be elevating Jesus Christ. Some have a lot, some have none. This is all happening at when, these, when these church people are getting assembled. Ultimately, there's a collective group issue here. See how, par, see how Paul starts here. He says, when you come together. So there's a collective issue 
And so I want us to think about today what distracts us from Jesus when we come together, when we, as- when we uh, assemble on a Sunday, on a Wednesday night at different ministry gatherings. There are here a few Ps that I believe these things can get in the way of us seeing Jesus clearly. One is perfection. Sometimes we're more concerned on a Sunday about getting a Sunday service right and not letting the spirit move, even if that means we're here an extra 15 to 20 minutes. Sometimes performance gets in the way where we rather project over being authentic or, uh, rather than being authentic. We care more about how we present and perform. Another distraction, possessions. What can I get over what I can give? Pleasures. I want to do what feels good for me, not worry about how it affects other people. And positions. I am owed this because of my title. Perfection, performance, possessions, pleasure, and positions. These are all things that can get in the way of us seeing Jesus clearly when we come together. And so this place where we gather, so I, I want to lay the foundation here, and we're, we're about to get into how Paul gives us instruction on how to do communion, but I want us to see that there are things, whether, it's, dis, whether the, it's divisions or distractions, these things get in the way of us seeing Jesus clearly. And so the place where we gather, the church, Vision Church for this matter, has to be a place where Jesus is shown and lived out authentically. Without it, we miss the purpose of this sacrament, the Lord's Supper, that's meant to be a reminder of him and how he came into our life, y'all. Continuing on, verse 23 through 26, part of what we read this morning. This is going to sound familiar. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, and after supper said, This, is, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do, then, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so this is where we see the essential instructions for how we are to partake in communion, which here at Vision we do every week with usually coming in and taking the cup and the wafer. But I want us to go back. I know there's a lot of scripture coming forth this morning. This will be in the sermon notes. But where do we see the first Lord's Supper happening? Well, it goes back to the Gospel of Matthew where we see this. As they were eating, Jesus took the bread blessed and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body. And then he took the cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I tell you, I will not drink from the fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. And after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So now I I, want to paint a little picture. I want you to join me in this. I want to put ourselves at this table with Jesus. We had the first supper. I suspect that some of you, you might even right now, when you think about the, the, the image that comes to mind immediately when I say the Lord's Supper, you might go back to a image from a photo, maybe one of the most recognizable uh, artists, um, uh, Leonardo da Vinci painted a photo, and I wish I had it on screen, called The Last Supper. It's one of the, it's immense in its, uh, you know, international, people have seen it, but also, too, uh, it's one of the most recognizable forms of art of all of human history. But there's a, If you look at the photo closely, there's a complexity of emotions. There's supposed to be a celebratory time for the Passover, which was where God, which was a celebration for where God freed the Israelites from Egyptian captivity. So they were, there was a part in which the disciples thought, we're just celebrating with Jesus. Now, Jesus is, now we learn as we read in Matthew that he is reclining with them. So at some level, there's a relaxed mood. He then goes on to briefly identify where it gets a little bit more serious, who's going to betray him. And with some confusion, he continues to use bread and wine to represent the parts of him that will be broken and shed on our behalf. You know, this is some wild stuff because he hasn't gone to the cross yet. He's just doing this after they've had a meal to celebrate Passover. I wonder what the disciples were thinking. 
They were just trying to celebrate. But Jesus was preparing for a deeper, more painful celebration that would be unfolding on Easter weekend that we'll celebrate here in a few weeks. He was, dev- he was inviting his disciples, his followers, into receiving the gift that Jesus was about to perform on the cross. Now, also then from here, I want to take a, a moment to think about how have you been taught to think about the Lord's Supper? Because we all come from different backgrounds. Maybe if, if you haven't been in church, maybe this is your first experience. But I know we got some church people in the house this morning. So you might have grown up maybe in the Catholic, a Catholic background where the bread and the wine literally, again, through the power of the Holy Spirit and the Eucharistic prayer, transform literally into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. That's called transubstantiation. Literally, it becomes. I mean, we see it as, as, as bread and wine, but it, it actually is the, it represents, or it not only represents, it, it becomes. And so that's from a Catholic point of view. Other denominations see it as more of a representation. This represents what was done at the cross. I grew up Methodist, and to my best understanding, there was honestly, if I can submit, some confusion around what does it actually mean, some of the language and prayer that was used. And so my question this morning is, depending on how you grew up, do you feel like that you understand the Lord's Supper in the right way? Because, again, going back to the original question, sometimes as we do traditions and rituals, we get caught up and we forget what the real purpose. We just we see it more as a, a gateway to the next thing of our day, not a remembrance of Jesus and what he did for us. So regardless of how you saw it performed, there tends to be, and I will submit here, even at Vision as one of your leaders, sometimes we see a scaled back focus on the sacrament. Again, like I said, sometimes we see it as a gateway, right? It's the last thing we do in our service, and sometimes our mind's already, where are we getting lunch? When does the game start? What's next in our day? And even at Vision here, and again, I think, again, not wrong, but we conveniently pack it in a way that's easy for you to take. You get it when you come in. It's in a, it's, it's the bread, the wafer, and the cup right there, just conveniently all packaged together. And let me say, this is not wrong, but here's what I'm asking us this morning. Do we miss the fullness of what Jesus is offering in and through this communion? Paul is asking us in verse 26 that as we eat or drink, we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. This is where the fullness of the meal, I really believe, comes into effect. Because in Jesus' death, we are, hear me out, given propitiation of our sins. In Jesus' death, we are given justification before God. In Jesus' death, we are given the power of sanctification. In Jesus' death, we are giving access to glorification for eternity. You see, his death gives us the power to die to ourselves so that we might fully live in him. That is what part of this is. There's a proclamation in this. Yes, we're proclaiming a death, but in that, there is a fullness of life that is in and through you as believers in Jesus. And so here's a remembrance. And and part of this is I want you to think, and we're going to take communion here shortly. The part is, what is your story with Jesus? What if before, each, before we did communion one Sunday, we had a chance to give the mic, and, you, and you, got, you had a 60 seconds to share your testimony? Could you do that? Because this part of this is a remembrance of what Jesus has done on your behalf. Here's my story. Growing up in a, a, growing up in a Christian household, I, saw, I went to church. I saw church things, but I just tried to be a good church person. The gospel never really took root. And so at the end of my days, I was really concerned what people thought about me and how I could perform to earn God's love. And I saw every circumstance is, I saw circumstances in light of, is God for me or against me? It all was about how my day was going, how events in my life were going. And it wasn't until the gospel really took root and I understood what he did on my behalf, in my place, that I was was okay with Jesus' performance on the cross. That's, That's the only performance that should matter to me. And it really doesn't matter what others think, even when they're upset with me as a consummate people person, because I have an audience of one. And so as I eat and drink of the cup and the the juice, I want to be reminded of this story. Now, what is yours? What is the thing that goes through your mind when when you're taking the wafer and drinking the juice? 
Is it what, how Jesus came into your life to redeem a relationship? Or was, it, was, it, was there a part of your heart that was fully dead until Christ came in? Was there something you couldn't kick an addiction until the gospel unleashed a power that you were able to kick that addiction? What is the thing where Jesus intersected that as you take communion, communally, you can celebrate? That is what I want us to do today. His dying enables my living. And I need daily reminders that living in him is the greatest joy I possess. I need regular re- opportunities to proclaim, the, to proclaim the gospel power I have residing in me. I need reminders of God's work in and through his people. I need regular reminders of God's provision that is sufficient. I need reminders that there is joy in suffering. And I absolutely need to re- be reminded that this life is not all there is. And here is the beautiful thing. Communion offers this reminder. All right, starting to wrap, the, starting to land the plane here. These are our last verses of this text, 27 through 34. Would you join me? Uh, read along. Well, I'll read. You look along. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. In this way, eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body, another version says discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many are sick and ill among you, and many have fallen asleep. If I were to properly, if I were properly judging ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may be not condemned with the world. 33. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, welcome one another. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home, so that when you gather together, you will not come under judgment. I will give instructions about other matters whenever I come. A lot packed up in there, but I want to. I want to. I want us to kind of hone in on three important warnings from this last section. Warning number one from verse twenty-seven: Don't eat or drink in an, in an unworthy way. What's in an unworthy way? Let me give a few examples. If you see the communion as being ritualistic, if you are indifferent about taking the cup, if you have an unrepentant heart, if there's things, if there's sins that you know that you, that for whatever reason you don't want to shake or you don't care about, if there's a spirit of bitterness towards somebody or any other ungodly attribute, y'all, this is how we drink in an unworthy way when these things are festering in our heart. And so a part of it is do we take the time to confess? And I know, again, Because sometimes we see communion as a gateway to ending the service. We don't give the proper time for the proper examination. And so we do eat in an unworthy way. Now praise God for his grace through Jesus Christ. But I do want us to take seriously what we're doing. Because it is a sacrament to be reminded what Jesus did on that cross. Warning number two. It says uh, from verse 29, do not eat or drink without, it says, discerning the body. Now, what this is meant to point towards is there is a weight to this act. I I think in in, in a lot of ways the Catholic Church has it wrong because, again, part of it is you feeling you have to earn to be able to take. But there's a certain weight that I think sometimes some of the, the mainline traditions, Catholicism, Lutheranism, Methodism, there's a certain weight that they even place on it that I think we would be healthy to learn from. There's a holiness to the celebration that reflects his body and his blood. And we cannot take lightly the greatest sacrifice on our behalf. And warning number three, it says don't eat or drink without others in mind. And this is so important because there is a communal component that when some don't, that when some don't take seriously this reverent act, it actually reflects on all of us. Now, again, there's not a screen projecting what's on your heart or your mind, so we don't know what everyone's thinking when they're eating or drinking. But do we take these warnings seriously about how it reflects each one of us, even this body of Vision Church? I want to be someone who takes it seriously. I know I, I, I don't, and there's grace for that. But, but I want to be the one, that I don't want to take it lightly or in, in an unworthy way. I don't want to not discern the body or take it seriously in its holiness. And I want to make sure that I'm taking with brothers and sisters in Christ that I'm trying to do life with and be authentic with. Because that is a representation representation of Jesus and his gospel. And so y'all, today, 
I think it's time to put into practice what we have been hearing and what we've been learning. Now, I want to frame today a little bit more thoroughly. So um, just you're going to have to bear with me here. But we're going to actually, the, the, la- the last part of the sermon here is going to be how we take, uh, we're going to do communion together. So I'm going to work into that, but give me one minute. I want to remember, I want us to be brought to mind how Jesus patterned his supper. He took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it. Let's see here. And then he gives it. Whether you have given your life to, whether you're giving your life to Christ today or whether you've been walking with him for many years, I want you to, to heed these words. Take, bless, break, and give. Because as a follower of Christ, you are never going to have to ask what's your purpose. The Lord's Supper just showed you. Because when you surrender your life to Christ, you become the bread, the daily bread, that he takes, blesses, breaks, and then gives to the world so that others might taste and see how good he really is. And so this morning, now, make sure I do this in the right order here. I'm going to bring over, I actually brought up some elements. I, you know, we brought some real bread in the house this morning. Now, I got the, the worship team is going to be behind here. And I'm going to explain how we're going to do this because we're actually going to do a communal form of, uh, of communion this morning. I, I'm going to ask the deacons to come up here in one second. But let me say this much. When I, growing up, I, I said, I mean, as I've told you guys time and time again, I was formed in the Methodist tradition. And one of the things, now we didn't do communion every Sunday, but here's what we did do. When we did do it, we went up to the front of the service, and uh, there was a, a slew. Usually there were some older heads and uh, f- just faithful members of the church. And uh, faithful saints, I mean, that, that's the way to honor them. <laughs> and they would have the, the bread, and they'd have a, a chalice of, of some grape juice. And they would, you'd go up with just a posture of humility before them, and they would, they usually knew you by name. Sandy, this is the body of Christ that was broken for you. And they would place it in your palm. And then they would say, and then you go to the next person, Sandy, this is the blood of Christ that has been shed for you for your sins drink from it and so you dip and you'd eat and there was a real blessing about the community of how we did that of someone saying your name of going up to a person to receive just like the disciples did that night at the first lord's at the the lord's supper that first time and so y'all i'm gonna um i'm gonna ask the the uh we're gonna that's what we're gonna do this mo- this morning uh, we have withheld the cups and the juice that are over here on the sides, and I'm going to uh, get the deacons to actually come up here. And it's going to take a few minutes, so that's why I've asked the team. Um, but I'm going to kind of graciously and hopefully with uh, order, we're going to dismiss so that you might do the same thing uh, and receive. Hold on one second. So here, as the, as the team comes forward, let me just uh, start us before we enter um, on the night in which he, uh, Jesus, he came before his disciples. He, uh, he took the bread and he, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which I'm going to break for you for the forgiveness of uh, or for my body that I'm going to lay down for you. And it's not only for you, but it's for us. And so he, he broke the bread and, and he took some of the bread and you should probably use real wine. We have uh, cranberry juice here. And uh, he might have asked the disciples, said, look down. You can see re- your reflection in the red. And take a moment and thank Jesus for opening, for opening his hands and shedding his blood for you. And remember that he did that not only for you, but for us. And so today, I just, we're going we're gonna to do this with each other in a communal way, in a different way. And so my, my one final note before we start is that maybe you're here today and you're saying to yourself, I want to live with God. I'm tired of doing life without him, of depending upon myself. Jesus is offering himself to you today. 
He's offering a common union with God. So we're about to participate in an ancient, in an ancient tradition. This moment is for those who follow Jesus. And so if that's not you, you can let this moment pass. Or if you're ready to surrender your life to Jesus, this might be your first act of faith this morning. Either way, I would encourage you to talk with one of the pastors, the deacons, one of the ministry leaders after service. Because remember, this is an us and our thing with Jesus, not a me and not a me and my thing. There's a communal piece. And so y'all, let's today, as I like to say, let's, as we're reminded in the Psalms, let's taste and see that, that indeed the Lord is good.